Some time ago, a brilliant young medical student from another land and a devout follower of one of the world's great Eastern religions came to see me. Through the months that I had known him, we had become good friends. I asked this young man three questions. John, who in your opinion is the greatest leader that the world has ever known? After a moment of hesitation, he replied, I'm sure that Jesus has done more good than anyone who's ever lived. I would say that he is the greatest leader. Then I ask, who do you think is the greatest teacher? No doubt he must have thought of Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, and the other great philosophers of ancient and modern times. But he answered, the greatest teacher is Jesus. Finally, I ask, John, in your opinion, who in the entire history of man has lived the most holy life? Immediately, he answered, there has never been anyone like Jesus. I've asked these three questions of men and women of all religions, even atheists and communists. The answer from all knowledgeable people is always the same, Jesus of Nazareth. I have yet to meet a single person who has honestly weighed the evidence, who does not believe that Jesus is truly the Son of God, the Savior of men, the promised Messiah. There is indeed no one like Jesus Christ. He is completely unique among all the human beings who have ever been born into this world. Wherever the true message of Jesus Christ has gone, people and nations have been revolutionized. New life, new hope, new purpose for living have been the result. Indeed, without fear of contradiction, we can say that Jesus Christ is truly history's greatest revolutionary, the man who changed the world. What do you want me to do for you? I want to see you again. <sighs> then see. Your faith has made you well. I can see. <laughs> Everything about Jesus was unique. The prophecies of his coming, his birth, his life, his teachings, his miracles, his death and his resurrection, his transforming power in the lives of those who love and follow him. Even his claims and his influence on history and the lives of many nations have been unique. In the next few minutes, I want to look at each of these unique features and explain why Jesus Christ is considered by knowledgeable people all over the world to be the greatest man who ever lived, the man who changed the course of history. First, the prophecies of his coming as the Messiah were unique and extraordinary. For hundreds of years before his birth, the great prophets of Israel had foretold that he was coming. The Old Testament, which was written by many individuals over a period of 1,500 years, contains more than 300 references concerning Jesus. For example, more than 600 years before his birth, the prophet Micah foretold the precise location 
of that event. Thus, when King Herod inquired of the priests and scribes where the Messiah was to be born, they replied, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Second, the birth of Jesus was unique and supernatural. Through the centuries, man has demanded signs that would enable him to discern what was true. God promised that the people could know when the true Son of God had appeared. The Old Testament records, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. In making his written report concerning the life of Jesus, Matthew confirms the extraordinary way in which Jesus Christ entered human history through a virgin birth. This supernatural birth set the stage for his perfect life of righteousness before God and man. Third, his childhood was unique and unparalleled. Though little is recorded of the childhood of Jesus, what is known of his early years suggests a young life that is without parallel, unequaled in the existence of man upon the earth. As a boy, during an annual family trip to Jerusalem, Jesus slipped away from his family and went up to the temple. While there, he engaged several learned men in discussion answering their questions and challenging their thinking with questions of his own. The Gospel of Luke records, and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. After discovering their son missing and diligently searching for him for three days, his parents found him and asked for an explanation of his absence. Jesus' answer at age 12 announced the very purpose for his life on earth. Why is it that you sought me, he asked. Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Fourth, his teachings were revolutionary and life-changing. His words and ideas are still changing the course of events today. Those who heard him speak during his life on earth were amazed, saying, no man ever spoke like this man. He said things that men had never thought or spoken before. Ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks will receive. And he who seeks will find. And the door will be opened to anyone who knocks. Down through the centuries, Hundreds of millions of people all over the world have agreed that his words are life-changing and have followed his teachings. Without question, the greatest teaching of Jesus was that salvation comes not by what man does for God, but by what God does for man through his Son, Jesus Christ. Salvation by faith, not works, is revolutionary because every man-made religion of the world teaches that man is saved by good deeds. Jesus repeatedly emphasized good works, but never as a means of salvation. Rather, God's word teaches that good works are produced in us by the Holy Spirit after we believe. Fifth, his miracles were supernatural and transforming. In addition to the revolutionary message he proclaimed, Jesus caused the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk and the dead to live again, that men would believe in him as the Holy One of God, the promised Messiah. Jairus, I'm sorry. Jesus! Your daughter has died. Don't bother the teacher any longer. Don't be afraid. Only believe and she will be well.
The crowds watched in amazement, and many were convinced that he was indeed the Son of God, the promised Messiah. Sixth, his death was sacrificial and revolutionary. Imagine any man predicting his own death, and yet that is exactly what Jesus did. Listen. We are going to Jerusalem, where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and treat him shamefully and spit upon him. He will be whipped and killed. But on the third day, he will rise. Jesus Christ was the only man in all of history who was born to die. His mission was to deliver us from the darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom and bring us into the kingdom of God. By dying on the cross for our sins, he willingly took upon himself the punishment that each individual person deserves because of his own sin. The animal sacrifices of the Old Testament covenant could not take away sin. Jesus Christ came to establish the new covenant by offering himself on the cross as one sacrifice for sins forever. It is by believing that Jesus Christ died for us and by receiving him personally that one becomes a Christian. Seventh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was miraculous and supernatural. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. The resurrection is a fact of history. Peace be with you. No event in history has been so carefully researched and documented as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul records that Christ was seen after his resurrection by Peter and the rest of our Lord's disciples, then by 500 Christian believers at one time, and finally by Paul himself. The risen Christ is at the heart of the Christian message. For Paul goes on to explain, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also vain, and you are still in your sins. Eighth, the claims Jesus made about himself were unique and unprecedented. He declared that he was God when he said, I and my Father are one. And who but Jesus would dare to announce, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus promised, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. What mere man could make such a statement? And again in the book of Matthew, he declared, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Either Jesus of Nazareth was who he claimed to be, the Son of God, the Savior of mankind, or he was the greatest imposter the world has ever known. He has accomplished more good for mankind than anyone who's ever lived. If his claims are false, we're faced with a moral dilemma that a lie has accomplished more good than the truth. What other man could make these impossible claims unless he truly was God in the flesh? Ninth, the influence of Jesus Christ on people and nations through the centuries has been revolutionary and world-changing. No one in the history of this planet has had a greater impact for good than Jesus of Nazareth. His influence has altered the course of nations and cultures. His teachings have been the basis of justice and his sacrificial love, the model for mankind. 
But even more important, his resurrection power has transformed the lives of hundreds of millions of believers through the centuries since he walked this earth in the flesh. Trace the life and influence of Jesus Christ and you'll observe that his message always affects great changes in the lives of many nations. History is his story. Remove Jesus of Nazareth from history and it will be a completely different story. Beginning in Jerusalem, the early Christians took his message to the ends of the then known world so that before 20 years had passed, even the enemies of the faith admitted, these who turned the world upside down have come here also. Like begets like. History's greatest revolutionary has produced the most revolutionary men of all time. Think of the impact the writers of the New Testament had on their culture and continue to have on modern society. Claiming the name of Christ, they have changed the course of history. The influence of Jesus is still revolutionizing our world. Christianity has spanned cultural diversities, prejudice barriers, and political differences. Kenneth Scott Lederat, famous professor at Yale University and respected historian, describes the worldwide effect of Christianity in this way. Thus we see that in one way or another, the impulse that can be traced back to Jesus has flowed out across the world, such that today, virtually the entire planet has been profoundly altered, indirectly at least, by the gospel of Christ. The late C.S. Lewis, professor at Oxford University, was an agnostic who denied the deity of Christ. Later, he became a devout follower of Christ and wrote many outstanding books advocating his belief in him as savior. In his famous book, Mere Christianity, Lewis makes this observation. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said wouldn't have been a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must take your choice. Either this was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but don't come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great moral teacher. He hasn't left that alternative open to us. I have yet to meet a single person who has honestly considered the overwhelming evidence proving the deity of Jesus of Nazareth who does not admit that he is the Son of God. Now, I've met many who do not believe that he is the Son of God, but as we've talked and reasoned together, they have been honest in confessing. I've not taken the time to read the Bible or to consider the historical facts concerning Jesus. Their resentment and rejection of Christ has been based upon an unfortunate childhood experience, upon the inconsistency of some Christian, or perhaps on the influence of a college professor. But always, they have admitted that they have not honestly considered the person of Jesus Christ and his claims on their lives. Some years ago, I was speaking to a group of students at the University of California at Los Angeles. Immediately following my address, an angry young student whom I later discovered was the leader of the Atheistic Society on the campus approached me. I resent your efforts to convince these students to become Christians, he said. You have no right to impose your views on them. You're older and more mature than they are, and they're like putty in your hands. Of course, he had conveniently failed to acknowledge that his goal as leader of the radical group on campus was to do everything he could to influence the students to follow his way. But rather than argue, I invited him to our home for dinner and he agreed to come. It was an interesting evening. We had a pleasant chat. I found him to be a very personable young man, brilliant of mind, very articulate. We had a good time together. After we finished our meal, I thought it appropriate to talk to him about Jesus. I would like to read something to you from the Bible, I told him. Hey, look, I told you, I don't believe the Bible. I really don't want to hear anything. He reacted strongly. I responded by saying, 
If you don't mind, I'll read a few portions of scripture anyway. So I turned to the first chapter of the Gospel of John and read, Before anything else existed, there was Christ with God. He has always been alive and is himself God. Eternal life is in him, and this life gives light to all mankind. His life is the light that shines through the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. I continued to read and finished with the verse, Christ became a human being and lived here on earth among us and was full of loving forgiveness and truth. And some of us have seen his glory, the glory of the only son of the heavenly father. Let me see that, he said eagerly. I don't think I've ever noticed that. I don't remember reading it. He read the passage thoughtfully and handed the Bible back to me without comment. Then I turned to Colossians chapter 1, beginning with the 13th verse, and read, For God has rescued us out of the darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom, and brought us into the kingdom of his dear Son, who bought our freedom with his blood, and forgave us all our sins. Christ is the exact likeness of the unseen God. He existed before God made anything at all, and in fact, Christ himself is the creator. By this time, the young man was very sober and his whole attitude of belligerence and antagonism had changed. When I finished, we chatted a bit. I asked if he would write in our guest book. He nodded. The Holy Spirit had used the inspired word of God to break through his antagonism. This young man had come face to face with the revolutionary life of the risen Son of God. After he wrote his name and address, he penned these words, the night of decision. Before my very eyes, the miracle of salvation had taken place. Who is Jesus of Nazareth to you? A myth, a mere man, or the revolutionary risen son of God? Your life upon this planet Earth and for all eternity is affected by your answer to that question. Many have heard the claims of Jesus Christ and for various reasons have refused or neglected to accept his pardon for their sins and his offer of eternal life. Others have received him as their Savior and Lord, embraced his teachings, repented of their sins, and as a result, they have discovered God's forgiveness, God's freedom, and the abundant life he has promised to those who trust and follow him. Each one of us must decide individually whether or not we're going to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. When we do, we can know and experience God's love and purpose for our lives. To do this, each of us must first realize that every person is sinful, every person is separated from God. Because of our stubborn self-will, we choose to go our own independent way apart from God. Jesus Christ, through his unique and revolutionary birth, life, death, and resurrection, is God's only provision for man's sin. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus confirmed this when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. From heaven you came, helpless babe. Entered our world, your glory veiled. Not to be served, but to serve. And give your life that we might live. This is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship. Thank you. 
Would you like to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord? If so, you may wish to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and my Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and for giving me eternal life. Take control of my life. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. Amen. Does this prayer express the desire of your heart? If so, I'm going to invite you right now to bow your head and make this prayer, which you've just heard, your personal prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and my Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and for giving me eternal life. Take control of my life. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. Now, if you prayed this prayer sincerely, you have just received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. You have experienced God's wonderful love and forgiveness, and you have become a child of God. God's eternal Holy Word promises that as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on His name. You also received eternal life, salvation, is a gift of God. Today, you have received Christ in your life by faith, and He promises never to leave you, never to forsake you. And as you begin your new life in Christ, you will discover that the claims of history's greatest revolutionary are true for you today. As you study His Word and obey His commands, you will begin to experience the abundant life He has promised. You will know the love and fellowship of the body of Christ, the church, as you faithfully worship and serve in a local church. And I encourage you to experience the joy of helping others to meet this revolutionary person, the Lord Jesus. Take the initiative. Tell everyone you meet about this wonderful person and his claims and the revolutionary way he can change their lives. And remember, never, never forget his wonderful promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world.